Hello, I'm Enrico Signoretti. It's nice to have you up here. <laughs> no, I, I, I just looked at my phone and um, there were like 23 I, Apple app updates. I said, what happened? And then I remembered, oh, because if you look at the details, it's Apple Watch, Apple Watch, Apple Watch, Apple Watch, Apple Watch. So get ready for all of your apps to update in the next day or two. All right. So hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, I'm glad that, uh, that we could all be here. I want to thank you, Enrico, for bringing me in. This is wonderful. I love coming to London. I, I'm in London usually a couple times, three times a year. As you can tell, I'm from France. And um, <laughs> yeah. I, I come from the US, and, uh, I, but I love coming here. Um, I'm talking about cloud today. Uh, I'm going to take a, uh, a much higher level uh, than uh, Mr. Evans, and I'm going to be much less entertaining than Mr. Poulton, so hopefully um, I will strike a balance right there in the middle. Um, also, uh, I'm one of those people who loves to look at my, my slides while I'm talking. I'm not going to read the slides, I guarantee, because the slides only have like three words on them. I just use it to help myself know where I am in my presentation, so hopefully you'll understand. So again, I'm, I'm Stephen Foskett. I, uh, I'm the uh, organizer of the Tech Field Day events, which is probably what I'm best known for now. I used to also write and speak a lot about storage. Uh, I was a uh, you know, columnist and a contributing editor for Storage Magazine, if you remember all that. And I've been here many times speaking, doing seminars and so on, on dif different storage topics. So I do come from a uh, storage background, but hopefully I will be able to uh, broaden this out and not have it be a uh, rehash of uh, Chris's uh, next generation storage presentation. In fact, I tried to exercise all examples of storage from my, from my deck. Uh, hopefully, I will succeed in that. So let me start um, with something that's going to seem something of a non sequitur, this guy. Um, one of those funny things uh, that, that comes when we talk about cloud is, is this, this strange reaction that people have to it. They, they either tend to have sort of a, a, a skepticism about cloud where they say it doesn't exist or it's just a marketing term or whatever, or they'll have a, a fear reaction. You know, this threatens me. This, this is not something that I want. Or they'll have an irrationally exuberant um, reaction. I love this stuff. This is the future. You all are the dinosaurs. <laughs> Nigel. Um, <laughs> what happened to the, 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 the Neanderthals? I'm going to come back to this a few times. Do you know what happened to these guys? Um, the sad, sad looking gentleman. Um, didn't we kill them all? Thank you, Chris. It's like I planted him in the, in the room. Conventional wisdom for a long time was we killed them all off. We came in, we smart people, homo sapiens came in, and we murdered them. <laughs> And literally, you know, killed them, or uh, we outcompeted them with our dogs and and ate all their food, and they starved in caves and so on. But that's actually not what happened. Um, modern genetic analysis tells us that something very different happened. We are them. Essentially, at many times in many places, we interbred with them, and we acquired various traits from them. And eventually, they were just not relevant anymore. And so, we did, so, so, so the world didn't need them anymore. But we are them. All of us have their genes in us today. Isn't that interesting? That's where cloud meets IT. I guess you can kind of figure out what conventional IT is in this picture. Um, I think this guy's wearing sandals and attending a Unix con convention. Um, but essentially, that's where I'm going here. We're not going to find conventional IT murdered by cloud. We're not going to find cloud eating its lunch, literally, and having conventional data center die in a cave somewhere. It's just going to change. And one day, we're going to wake up, and things will be different. That's my opinion on cloud. So I've been giving um, talks for a long time. Uh, as I said, mostly on storage. Back in the uh, you know, earlier part of this century, uh, a lot of the time when I was doing these talks, the question would come up, what? 
what is this cloud anyway? What is this thing? It was like people were, were really oblivious to uh, what was coming. And yet, you know, they, they, even though they approached it as something that was new and radical and different, they had no idea even what it was, what was happening. At this same time, while IT was happily going about their business doing regular stuff with servers and storage, in all these cloud application data centers, they were reinventing everything. I think that's one of the things that shocks those of us who have watched the industry for a long time. The extent to which these new applications uh, were developed without regard for anything that had gone before. And in a way, that's their unique benefit. They were a new species coming in. Um, when, when Google looked at the internet and said, we want to index that thing instead of just having a human maintained index like Yahoo. We want to have an automated index. Their solution, can you imagine how laughable it would have been if their solution had been, well, we're going to need a really big mainframe and maybe IBM will give us a discount on DB2, right? That would have been just totally ludicrous. It would have been just as ludicrous for them to say, well, Solaris, that's the way to go. And then, you know, we'll put it on a really big, you know, enterprise class Spark server and hook up an EMC array to it. That would have been just as ludicrous. But the funny thing is, they didn't even think of those things because they were a totally different breed. They were a different species of people. And so they came to the problem and said, how do we solve this problem? And what they came up with looks absolutely nothing like enterprise computing of the past. What they came up with really is summed up by this whole idea of distribution and eventual consistency. You have, you know, uh, instead of this, this, this fixation that enterprise IT has had for so long on complete consistency and synchronicity of everything, you know, everything has to be right everywhere all the time. That's the enterprise mindset. And that has been the enterprise mindset since the uh, 1970s and the mainframe world, right? You cannot have things be wrong somewhere. It all has to be right everywhere. And, and the, the, the secret of, of the cloud is rejecting that, just walking away from that, not even knowing that that's a, 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 an axiom to live by and saying, well, we have to break it up and we won't know the whole answer and nothing will have the complete picture and nothing will be in sync and eventually everything will agree. That's the cloud. So, IT was obliviously doing its thing while this whole world of cloud computing rose up. In the earlier part of this decade, I spent a lot of time trying to reassure IT that that thing behind you isn't going to kill and eat you. By the way, do you, anybody recognize the movie reference here? Um, yeah, that thing in this movie is going to kill and eat her. But, um, in IT, I mean, the cloud, uh, frankly, scared a lot of people. And so when I talked to systems administrators and so on, the, uh, the response earlier in this decade was, this thing, I I'm going to be out of a job. You know, there are going to be no more data centers. My company's just going to move everything to Amazon. We're done. You know, close up, close the doors. You know, maybe I can, uh, you know, maybe I can get in, uh, into some other career track here. Maybe I can get some retraining. This is just as ridiculous, right? I mean, this, this isn't how IT works. Uh, as you know, Chris mentioned, you know, the, the, the mainframe still exists. And in fact, most of our most critical, I don't want to say applications because that doesn't do them justice, but most of the most critical IT systems in the world are mainframe applications. And they probably will be for a long, long time. Because it, it, the, the mainframe ideal of everything is consistent all the time and, 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 and we have an answer, a right answer, and there's only one right answer, that, that's a great thing when you're flying airplanes and selling tickets and things like that. You, know, you need to have this knowledge and it needs to be consistent everywhere. But yet, so many other systems don't need that. Um, I, I used to work in uh, point of sale in retail, and in retail, for the longest time, there was this fixation on the mainframe ideal that, you know, when, th when, when a thing is purchased, it has to be purchased. It has to be, 
you know, correct. Um, do you think that's how Amazon works? Do you think Amazon has a single database that says who bought what and when everywhere in the world? Of course not, because they realize that that's actually not important for retail. It is important for airplanes, right? If, if you can't sell the same seat to two different people, unless you do that on purpose, but the point is you, you can't sell the same seat to two different people accidentally. Um, but Amazon can certainly sell you know, a laptop to two different people at the same time because there's more than one of them. You know? So retail is, has changed and um, you know, there, there, there are applications that are slowly peeling off from this mindset and going into a new mindset. But it's not gonna be the apocalypse. Now here we are in 2015 and we've got people like Nigel um, and so many others. I don't mean to pick on you, buddy. I love you. Um, so many others who seem to just love this thing. So they've gone from, ah, you know, Godzilla's attacking to, hey, I love this cloud. This thing's awesome. You know, there's all this enthusiasm about, you know, Docker and Vagrant and CoreOS and Ceph and all these these you know, cloudy things, and people are saying, yes, DevOps is gonna take over the data center. That seems irrational to me too, because it seems out of touch with the reality of how things work. Essentially, um, just like nature, you know, something that's ill-adapted to its environment will not survive. And the cloud is ill-adapted to a lot of the sort of applications that different enterprise companies use just like the traditional mainframe is ill-adapted to the cloud, and just like what we call open systems is ill-adapted to the cloud. You have to figure out what the balance is and where things fit and where things don't. So where do we go next? Well, this is my, this is my prediction for the future. In another few years now, we're all gonna be like so many jaded teenagers when we talk about the cloud. You'll know that it has succeeded when nobody uses the word anymore when it's not cloud computing, when it's just computing, when it's not hybrid cloud, it's just how we do stuff. Uh, when you say this application, well, that one should run on Amazon and this other one should run on you know, Verizon. I don't know if you have Verizon over here, but if you did. Oh, how about Rackspace? They're number two in the cloud, right? Th th this application can run on Rackspace. This other one can span our data center and Rackspace. And this other one only runs in our data center. And that's just a decision you make instead of an apocalypse or a, uh, a lifestyle choice or something like that. It's just sort of there. So when it comes to the cloud, for the longest time we've been pitched that there's this, um, this binary choice that we have to make, that there's the public cloud, this thing, this big thing. And by the way, um, I, I really wish that I was presenting this tomorrow because Amazon is finally gonna split out their cloud revenue tomorrow and tell us all how successful they've been. Um, so, so watch all the news explosion, by the way, tomorrow when they do this, because the answer is going to be very, very telling about the future of public cloud. You know, finally, Amazon is gonna tell us how many billions of dollars they make with AWS and S3 and similar services and how profitable those services are for them. Um, and that is going to drive a whole avalanche of similar reporting from pretty much every other company in the cloud space. So we're going to suddenly find out just how popular and successful and profitable the public cloud is. Because there have been a lot of, um, certainly there's a lot of enthusiasm for it, but there's also a lot of skepticism for the cloud that says, yes, that's all well and good, but how many of you are really running in Amazon? How many applications are you really running there? How much money are you really giving to it? And for the longest time, that data has been hidden. It's been secret. So we're gonna find out. But we've been pitched this as a, as, as a series of binary choices. You have, you have public cloud, you have private cloud, and then you have this sort of intersection that is hybrid cloud. But that's not really how things are. Um, increasingly, what I'm seeing are things that are public, yes, things that are private, yes, and things that are hybrid, but also a lot of things that are sort of cloudy, you know, cloud-like uh, systems and services. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, we also still have a lot of things that are not really cloud, and then this thing over here. Um, essentially, this is the future of IT right here. Yes, we're gonna have public cloud, but we're also gonna have that thing down there, whatever that is, you know? It's just how it's going to be. Um, so let's, let's talk about hybrid, since that's what I was asked to talk about. Um, 
what is a hybrid really? Uh, one could think of it as Homer's car that Chris showed us, the, uh, the, the one thing that does everything. That's, in fact, I was thinking of using that image, so you totally scooped me. Um, instead, I used this guy. This is a fruit basket tree. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this uh, fruit salad tree, um, depending on where you come from. It's a hybrid tree that grows many different fruits all on one tree. Um, yes, that's a thing. <laughs> Uh, is that a hybrid cloud? Is a hybrid cloud system something that is public and private and both? Is it Homer's car that has public and private just sort of wedged in there? Or is it something much more seamless? Um, I think what we're going to find is that real, you know, the, the thing that has legs, the thing that is the dominant species that's going to knock off whatever we've been doing for the longest time, is something that's a lot more nuanced. Instead of just being, this is cloud, this is not, we're going to see different traits emerge in different applications that are going to allow us to get to a hybrid future without even noticing that we're there. In a way, it's like um, speciation. You know, how, how did these finches become different finches? In America, a lot of people seem to have problems with science. I'm not one of them. Um, <laughs> science tells us that these things did not spring from the mind of some omnipotent being one day, that they gradually diverged, and that they just came about over time, that things started appearing because they were better fits, and they made sense. And then one day, some guy came in on a ship and looked at them and said, well, that's a different from that. But they weren't always that different. And in fact, they're continuing to change. It's just when you look at them today that they seem uh, that different. And in this way, I feel like we're not going to really notice when cloud has arrived because we haven't noticed that it has arrived already. Um, just looking at storage, so storage is my background. Again, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning. We have a lot of different things now. And a lot of them are cloudy. And many are more cloudy, and some are less cloudy. But they're all getting there. And so we look at the different, uh, you know, the different protocols and so on. You know, it's not like the cloud police are going to come in, or you know, cloud Darwin is going to come in and classify things and say, EMC, thou art not cloudy. You know, NetApp, OK, thou art cloudy. You know, I mean, that's never going to happen. What's going to happen is, People are going to use them however they use them, and they're going to do whatever they do, and they're going to be a, there's going to be a whole spectrum of, of cloudy things. It always strikes me when I'm talking about cloud storage specifically that when you say the word cloud storage, people think S3, as if that's some synonym for cloud storage, but it's not. S3 isn't even the most cloudy storage there is. In fact, far from it. It's not all that cloudy at all. It just happens to run in public. S3 has a lot to do you know, it has a lot more in common with the uh, archiving systems and so on that were invented in the late 90s and early 2000s than it does with what I would consider a really flexible cloud infrastructure. Now, that doesn't mean that S3 isn't good. In fact, it's great. I'm an enthusiastic user and uh, paying, you know, my, my $2.53 goes into Amazon's uh, coffers every month to pay for my S3. Um, but there's a lot more cloudy stuff than that. Um, perhaps um, the most telling you know, example that I can think of right now you know, is uh, you know, Chris is looking at photos on his phone right here in the front, uh, the front aisle. Um, that is the most cloudy application I can think of because it's, it's uh, you know, Apple's photos, there is no interface. There's no application. There's nothing. It just is. And when you take a picture, it goes in the cloud and it magically appears somewhere else. It just is. It's just part of the, the thing, part of the phone. And the same with so many other applications. Um, one of the things that I'm going to talk about here, actually, I'll just go ahead and switch. Um, in terms of uh, you know, cloudy technologies that are emerging, one of my favorites is this one down here, um, cloud management, essentially. And at Tech Field Day, uh, one of the things that happens, we, have, uh, we do networking field day, wireless field day, uh, storage field day, and so on. Um, one of the remarkable changes that I've seen recently that most of the world probably hasn't noticed happening is the emergence of cloud-based management. 
essentially a, 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 a unified management framework that runs on really heterogeneous multi-tenant systems and has them all reporting into a cloud application. And then instead of pointing your web browser and your Java install and so on at some local thing that's running in the Clarion in your data center, you point your web browser to something that runs up there. So when Cisco bought Meraki, for example, I don't know if you, anybody here knows much about that, um, uh, Meraki was a Wi-Fi access point company. And people said, well, why did Cisco, the dominant player in Wi-Fi access points, want another Wi-Fi access point? Well, the answer is none of, n nothing of the sort. Cisco wanted their cloud, unified cloud management technology because Meraki figured out how to basically bring all of your touch points, everything you do with this important enterprise component to bring that into their cloud as a you know, public cloud application. But yet with security and quality of service and you know, multi-tenancy and administrative controls and all that stuff uh, locked in. There are many, many enterprise products uh, that have similar things. Um, you know, Exablox, for example, I wrote a white paper for them recently about um, doing the same thing with a storage array a really not cloudy storage array, a really sitting in your data center storage array with you know, cloud management. This stuff is here. If we look around at how things happen, you know, uh, somebody mentioned scale out this morning. Um, you know, this is another example of um, cloud technologies that are slowly working their way into really non-cloudy systems. You, know, you can't get much less cloud than a fiber channel storage array or a iSCSI storage array. But yet, so many of these products today have um, scale out features that are inspired uh, by and specifically developed from research done by you know, computer scientists working on cloud applications. So all of this stuff are, are technologies that are coming in to the data center. Um, PCs came in to uh, the enterprise in a very interesting way. Essentially, one day, some guy got fed up waiting for mainframe time, bought one, bought an electric pencil, brought, you know, brought it in under his arm, put it on his desk, and said, OK, IT, what are you going to do about it? You know, I got my own computer now. A lot of people have feared that, that the cloud is going to destroy IT in the same way, that one day, the salesman who puts Salesforce.com on his Amex and has it become an indispensable product is somehow undermining IT. I don't think that's happening. There was no alternative. There was no conventional IT system that was just as good as Salesforce. Salesforce was awesome, so people bought it and used it. It's the same as Dropbox. You know, Dropbox is awesome. People use it. It's not like you know, it was a rebellion. Instead, it's, it's, it's very different. Um, cloud is going to come in silently, quietly. One of the problems uh, you know, uh, that I see with a lot of this stuff is that IT has been very slow to adopt new technologies. Technologies come in waves. And I've seen this again and again. Now, I could be much more specific. I decided to, to have this be um, you know, more general to compute. Um, but you see these waves of technology that kind of rise up one on another. IT has been slow to adopt this stuff. Yes, it adopts it, but it adopts it at a lower curve. And we have to watch out for the fact that there's a growing gap between state-of-the-art computing and what IT does. And the question then is, uh, you know, Martin and I were, were hypothesizing on this last night. The question is, does the state-of-the-art collapse eventually once it becomes too high, too far from what people are actually doing? And the way that that would happen, for example, is a company would come out with a great new technology that builds on, you know, whatever, builds on, you know, hyperscale compute. And the VCs would take a look at it and say, yes, that's awesome, but no, it has no chance of being adopted, so I'm not going to fund it. That's the collapse of innovation. Or does mainstream IT suddenly one day wake up and say, whoa, that stuff is cool, and adopt it? Or is it something in the middle? where you know, maybe they meet somehow. Um, I really think that how it's going to come about is it's going to come about when nobody's noticing, when nobody's looking. And I think these guys are really delivering the future of cloud, and specifically the future of hybrid cloud. 
if you look at where Microsoft is heading and where VMware is heading, most of their development is centered around not destroying conventional IT, not even really displacing it with their own stuff. I mean, certainly Microsoft and VMware both are pushing an agenda that says maybe you don't need as much conventional IT and so on. But it's about enabling a seamless path between the data center and the cloud where you won't notice where things are happening and where things are going. And so I think that's where the future is. Eventually, IT becomes a service provider like Azure, like um, Amazon, and so on. Um, and in many ways, many applications will seamlessly make that transition. Some won't, some will, and it's going to be a mixture. But I have to stop. OK, so uh, do we have any questions, any comments? Good. I didn't want to talk to you people anyway. <laughs> All right. No. Yes, we do. OK, thank you, Julian. Is private cloud a dead-end industry? Uh, that's a good question. Is private cloud a dead-end industry? Um, could be if what you're defining as private cloud is building your own Amazon. Um, the, the, the question to me that's most important is not, you know, what does it do so much as what am I going to use it for? And one of the problems, for example, with OpenStack is a lot of enterprise has been enthusiastic about it, but they haven't figured out what they're going to do with it yet. You know? And so I'm seeing a huge amount of interest in OpenStack specifically, but a lot less actual production use of it. Because frankly, if they have an application that wants to run in that sort of environment, they're going to run it in the environment, the, the, you know, in the public cloud. Um, if they can't run it in the public cloud, I know that that's a sensitive topic over here, and I don't blame you guys for not wanting to run things in the US. Um, certainly, yeah, heck, my servers don't run in the US. Um, certainly, I could see uh, building your own Amazon as an alternative, as a great alternative, but perhaps a better alternative might be using a public cloud provider in the jurisdiction that you prefer, instead of um, trying to, to keep up. Uh, with that. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned and skeptical about that. Yeah. So, um, I've seen a study lately that said that, you know, building on-premise cloud, actually, if you, if you keep it more than six months, it's actually more economical to deploy the stuff on-premise mm -hmm. than to do it in a, in a public cloud provider. Yeah. Uh, so, do you think that the on-premise deployment will actually disappear? Because if you actually do the math, on the long term, two to three to five years, it's more economical to do it yourself, actually. Yeah, that's true. And um, let me give you an example. One of the companies that I was talking to, uh, I don't want to mention the name because they don't publicize that they do this, but a, a well-known IT software service company. Anyway, they do, they, they have their deployment model is to deploy things first in Amazon so that they can grow seamlessly and aggressively so that basically if this new product is a tremendous success, they'll be able to just keep turning that dial up. But once a few months has passed and they figured out what the customer adoption rate is going to be and how much resources they're going to need, then they move it internally um, to uh, uh, actually in this case it is an OpenStack system. Um, they don't tell their customers they're doing that because they don't really want people to think about what it's running on. But I think that's actually a really good point. And that was one of the problems with a lot of these cloud services is that it is absolutely cheaper to build your own if what you're building is big enough and long-lasting enough. You know, if it's not a long-lasting project, if you're just doing it for a little while, then there's no way you could build that internally. And if it's not big, that's the other thing, too. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't economically compete with Amazon S3, even though I can just go buy hard drives and stuff like that, because I'm only using a few gigabytes. <laughs> you know, um, It wouldn't make any sense for me to do that. And I think that's the same with enterprise. So you know, perhaps that's where the, uh, the future lies for private cloud, is, is if people, more and more people adopt this public first, private later approach. All right. I guess you yeah. can see that private cloud is more the more cautious route to the, the public cloud is maybe the more sort of circuitous route. Mm -hmm. the, the scenic route. <laughs> the scenic route. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, eventually a lot of these people who are aiming for private cloud at the moment, maybe one day they will be mm -hmm. on public cloud next, but just through their own risk appetite uh, are just looking at the private only at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and, and once maybe further security or whatever other uh, concerns that they have at this point in time have been resolved, or at least in their mind, um, then they would be willing to make that route. So I, I don't think it's really a dead end, it's just a, a more cautious route. Yeah, I think maybe it's just not here yet. You know, maybe we just haven't gotten to the point yet where people have the applications to run on their private clouds. You know, they haven't decided what they're actually going to do with it um, yet. And certainly there is a lot of concern about it. I think that a lot of uh, people, especially, uh, frankly, outside the US, I see a lot more concern and skepticism and fear of public cloud than I'm, than I'm seeing inside the US, which is an interesting element. And I think that has a strong political dimension. Well, American companies that yeah. in that space, so people are, are cautious. I think that's true. I think that there's, well, certainly there's, there's the political angle of data security and uh, privacy and, and so on. But, but also there is that whole homegrownness of it that, frankly, um, you know, if you're in Silicon Valley, you're going to develop your product using Silicon Valley stuff, and that's going to be cloud. Whereas if you're not there, you're not going to have that comfort level with it. So. But I see that, 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 that it's just part of that path. And I agree that, that, that eventually we will get there. Eventually we will, we will get there. And, and, and as I said, though, I want the, the, the summary of this whole thing to be simply this. There's going to come a time when, when it won't be cloud computing anymore. It'll just be computing. It'll just be how we do stuff. And I really, truly believe that that is what's going to happen. We're going to get there.